Thank you so much. You've just eaten, so hopefully I will keep you awake. Because as your glucose rises and you feel satiated, so we are going to go through endocrinology of pituitary growth and puberty. Because when you think about growth, you can't not think about the pituitary and not think about puberty. So, so as you, our favorite, my my favorite part, and hopefully yours too, of the brain, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the very close to the optic chiasm, and. The pituitary gland, now this session, like uh, Dr. Sabella said, is going to be mostly a didactic session. Um, um, the questions uh, that will follow in the question and answer session will cover a lot of these topics. So the pituitary gland, as you know, is contained in the cella tersica, and it's a really tiny gland, only three millimeters, as um, I, uh, when we explain to the patients, you can tell them right between the eyes, an inch inside, as small as a lentil, and it, um, remember all that it does increase in adolescence, and that's very, very important because recently I had a child who was thought to have a pituitary tumor, and what she basically had on the MRI was a little prominence of her pituitary, and when you spoke to the radiologist, remember if there's something like that, call your friendly radiologist and say, is this normal? You know, Because it is normal to have a little prominence in adolescence. And the pituitary stalk, very important that it connects the pituitary to the hypothalamus. So when you think about embryology, that's very important in the pituitary because the posterior pituitary has a different embryological origin than the anterior pituitary. The posterior is the neurohypophysis. It's a downward pocketing of the diencephalon, so it's neural in origin. And that's important because the posterior pituitary, the neurons live in the hypothalamus, these axons go down, and then they store their hormones in the posterior pituitary. For example, with DI, when you have stretching of the stalk or a, neural, a neurosurgery, then you have release of all that vasopressin from the posterior pituitary, causing that triphasic response of SIADH, um, you know, followed by, by DI, followed by SIADH. So always remember that any disturbance of that stalk can actually lead to release of vasopressin hormone. Um, and that, that's very different from the anterior pituitary lesions where it's from the adenohypophysis and that's from the oral ectoderm. And so whenever you have an anterior pituitary problem, it's more the cells are living right in the anterior pituitary. So things like radiation, um, some space occupying lesion in the, in the cella, that can push and crush that anterior pituitary, those cells, and that's when you're gonna have anterior pituitary hormone problems. So hormones, again, the uh, hypothalamic hormones are all the releasing hormones, and the pituitary hormones are the anterior FSH, LH from GNRH, TRH causes release of TSH, CRH causes release of ACTH, GHRH causes release of growth hormone, and the posterior pituitary, there's prolactin and ADH. Again, just to give you an, a visual. So growth hormone, and I will be showing this picture a little um, from time to time because I also like to think about what suppresses growth hormone, what stimulates growth hormone, and what inhibits growth hormone. Now, you don't have to remember this for your boards necessarily, but it's important to remember clinically um, because when, suppose you send me a patient in, in, in the clinic and I'm doing a growth hormone stimulation test, you need to know what that is of when you explain to your patients because that's an alpha adrenergic um, you know, a stimulus that I, I might be giving. Also, hypoglycemia can cause growth hormone release. We use that for uh, diagnosing growth hormone deficiency in the newborn period. Um, obesity actually suppresses growth hormone, but it's a kind of a weird uh, connection there. This is gr growth hormone, not IGF-1 we're talking about. And glucocorticoids also suppress, and uh, hyperglycemia suppresses it. Also inhibited by undernutrition, acute illness, and chronic illness, and some uh, deficiencies there. Sorry. So growth charts. Now this one is important to remember because the 
when you look at the boy growth chart and the grow girl growth charts, I put them both here because you want to remember when the peak growth velocity happens in girls and boys. And that you can see in this chart where you can see that the peak growth velocity in girls happens much earlier than boys. And that happens around about 10 or 11 years of age. And the boys are have hitting their peak growth velocity more like 14, 15 years of age. So that classic picture of the eighth grade dance where you have the girls shorter than, the, I mean the boys that are shorter than the girls, um, and that's because of their growth velocity is earlier than the boys. And that of course is related to puberty. So parents don't understand this, um, you know, when an easy way to um, explain to parents is just show them the growth curve because you may not have access to this chart in your clinic. So just show them the growth curve and you can see that there's a portion of the growth curve where you can see 10 centimeters a year. That's your peak growth velocity where it crosses the two boxes. That's where they're hitting the peak growth velocity in boys and girls and you can show it to them that way. So normal growth. Um, so fetal growth is not dependent on growth hormone. That's why growth hormone deficient babies are actually normal in size. They're not small in, in size. Fetal growth is more influenced by insulin, and that's why your baby of an in diabetic mom is large for gestational ages, but not because of growth hormone, it's because of insulin. Um, it, also thyroid hormone affects growth, leptin, IGFs, and in the, the, in, in the infant, growth hormone becomes very, very important for both glucose regulation as well as growth. So you can see that the infant grows about three and a half centimeters a month. Of course, it's so hard to measure them at that age, which can also lead to a problem in the growth charts. And infant growth is also influenced by thyroid hormone and insulin. And in childhood and adolescents, you can see that growth spurt is more because of growth hormone and the sex steroids. So another thing to think about growth is the change in body proportions. So it's not an overall increase in growth, but you can see that what I'm talking about is the upper and the lower segment. The way you measure it, ideally, if you think about ideal ways of measuring, you would sit them and then measure the upper segment and, and minus that from the height. But in, in a practical way, what I do is I don't measure the upper segment, I just measure the lower segment. I have them stand straight, put up uh, the point at the pubic symphysis, right down to the ground, and that's your lower segment. And you minus that from your upper segment, and you get your upper and lower segment ratio. What does this really mean? If you visualize a baby versus an, a school-age kid versus an adult, you'll understand what I'm saying. In a baby, they have a short, stocky trunk, sorry, short, stocky legs and a bigger trunk, and then it equalizes to one-to-one. -to -one. So that's where this upper and lower segment ratio comes in. So at birth, it's 1.7. Three years, it's 1.3. And at, by 10 years, it's one to one, which means upper and lower segments are both equal. Okay? So it is important to measure. The reason to measure that is because a lot of your growth happens in the spine. So if you have a problem with the spinal growth or you have a problem with the cartilage growth, like achondroplasia, then you can have a very much, you can have a market difference in the upper to lower segment ratio. And that's why it's an important little measurement to do. Of course, BMI is very important to measure. Arm span, also important because um, your arm span should be almost equal to your height or just about equal to your height. And the way to measure it, the easiest way I find rather than having them move around like this, is have them touch a fixed point in your, in your office, like a corner of the, of the wall, and then just um, mark this point, and that's your arm span. And it's very important to measure arm span, because sometimes if you have a scoliosis or a problem in the spine with the, um, uh, say, create a spinal radiation uh, survivors of cancer, then you can have a problem where the arm span may be longer than your height because of your decrease in spinal growth. Mid-parental height. Now, this is the whole thing about, oh, you know, my, my dad and mom are tall. Why can't my child be tall? It's not about the grandparents. It's really about the parental height, and that's your genetic potential. So in some EMR systems, it's very nice that you can put your height and weight and it just spits out a number and puts it on your growth chart. If you have that in your EMR, great. Otherwise, in your offices, it might be nice for you to just ask, what's your mom's height, what's the dad's height, and put a mid parental height just as a little arrow on your growth chart because this question will keep on coming. 
So causes of growth failure, they're mostly non-endocrine. You know, so many consults I get, because the pediatrician will see that little drop in the growth, but it really is non-endocrine. Search non-endocrine before you search endocrine. Um, remember that the most common cause of growth failure is actually nutritional. So pay attention to that. Ask a detailed history about the, way, about the food, a dietary history. If you don't have time in your offices, just send them to the nutritionist before you send them to endocrine. It's actually a cheaper consult to, to have. So nutritional, think about IBD, celiac disease, liver disease, you know, cardiac disease, anemia, very, very important cause of growth failure. I can ne never forget this kid who came to me when I was a fellow who um, looked really pale. And he, she was having delayed puberty, and of course she was severely anemic. Same thing more recently, there was a baby who had, um, who looked like the color of the wall behind me, and uh, had been through multiple specialties for all sorts of, um, uh, you know, issues with poor growth, but ended up just having anemia from, um, you know, the um, milk, um, food, milk uh, protein allergy anemia. Uh, pulmonary disease, renal dysfunction, you heard all about RTA, that can also cause growth failure. And psychosocial short stature, very important, especially when you have adoptees coming from, um, you know, into an adopted family and they're coming to you for growth failure, that can be a very important source of growth failure. Endocrine causes of growth failure. So after you've excluded or at least gotten the history of all the other causes, then you think about endocrinology. Don't think about growth hormone first. Then you want to think about constitutional delay, genetic short stature, it could be isolated growth hormone deficiency, hypopituitarism, could be thyroid, could be precocious puberty because you missed the precocious puberty or somebody didn't notice and then all of a sudden, hey, they just had menses last week and they're short, do something. You know, that's your precocious puberty who ended up short. Or congenital adrenal hyperplasia because of increased secretion of the um, androgens. Cushing syndrome, and I'll show you graphs of each of these conditions so that you can get an idea what I'm talking about. Pseudohypoparathyroidism and also uncontrolled type 1 diabetes. So I just listed those for you, but we'll go through some graphs. Then syndromes, of course, this is not a genetics lecture, so I am not going to go through each of these syndromes. I'll just pick a few to show you. But know that look for, um, you know, dysmorphism, do a an un fully undressed exam. I can't stress that enough. I find residents, fellows will keep the kid in their clothes. You cannot do a good dysmorphism exam if you have the child fully clothed. So please take that, as, especially when you're seeing the ch child for the first time or that growth becomes a question, make sure you do an undressed exam. Assessment of growth failure. So we went through a little bit. Do a comprehensive history. Birth weight, very important because SGA kids are at risk for growth failure later on. So ask about the SGA. You can even have a chart for the SGA to plot them if you're doubtful whether they fit into SGA or not. There are SGA charts available. Chronic illness, medication exposure. Remember that ADHD meds, independent of their effect on appetite, can cause growth failure. So just because somebody's eating okay on an ADHD med, they can still have growth failure from the effect of the medication. Diet history, very, very important. Um, I recently had an athlete who um, looked like their BMI was okay, but this girl was running competitive cross country and she was eating okay, but she was not growing. And that's because she was, when you, when you had the nutritionist go in and get a good history, it looked like she was really not fueling her in, herself enough for her workouts that she was doing. So she, her growth was suffering because of that. So don't assume that just because your BMI may look okay, that um, your nutrition is essentially okay. Ask more in history, especially if you're seeing that height drop. Development, then family history, parental heights, and parental pubertal history, because you may have a history of pre precocious puberty in the parents, or like we'll go ahead, and constitutional growth delay where the mom says, well, I had my menses at about 15 years of age, or it's very important to ask when the dad started shaving, because the dads don't remember the puberty, but when they started shaving, they will usually remember. If they don't remember that, then you can ask them if they grew into college, because that's another question to ask about puberty in the dad. 
So physical exam, accurate height is so, so important without shoes. Make sure that the three points are touching the back of the wall. That is your, the, the child's heels, the child's butt, and the child's back of the head are touching the wall and the Frankfurt plane is just parallel to the ground. So that's the way you're going to check the height and not going up or down, you know, raise the neck if you can. And don't use, uh, try not to use a stadiometer that has a flexible arm. Try to use a stadiometer that has a fixed arm uh, if, if you can. The physical examples, uh, physical exam is so important. Look for mid-face hypoplasia. Mid-face hypoplasia is just like this, this part of the face is just a little bit small, like you have the high arched palate, just a tiny, you know, it looks a little bit smaller in that part of the face. Look for the upper and lower segments if you can now. I'm saying all this, I know what it is to be a pediatrician because I was a pediatrician in general practice before I became an endocrinologist. And there's no time, right? You get 15 minutes and you're supposed to do all this. You tell them about safety, helmet safety, gun safety, what are the safety, everything, and you're supposed to do all that and do all this. But if, if you recognize growth failure, maybe you can call them back for a second visit where you really you know, do more rather than just in your well-child exam. So work up. And you can do this before you send them to the endocrinologist. You, may, you might find the reason yourself. So CBC differential, very important. ChemComp, including liver function tests. I put prealbumin there, even though there are nutritionists that would say prealbumin is not useful. But for me, it's just also a talking point if it's on the lower side to tell the parents, hey, this is one objective way that I'm saying that your child's not getting enough nutrition. Thyroid function tests, um, you can do a free T4 TSH. Growth factors, IGF-1 and IGF-BP3. You can consider celiac disease. I put consider, but I would say just do the karyotype. Doesn't hurt. If you have a girl with short stature, just send a karyotype. It's a cheap enough test, and you will not miss mosaic Turner syndrome. And a bone age x-ray of the left hand. Back to our... Um, diagram here because when we talked about all the uh, what happens with growth hormone GHRH um, is a local hormone that affects the pituitary to secrete growth hormone and growth hormone binds with IGF-1 and goes to the um, growth plates where you know growth hormone goes directly to the growth plates it also goes to the liver where it binds to growth hormone receptor that's where IGF-1 is made so if you have Poor nutrition, your IGF-1 may be low just from poor nutrition. That's why we also check the binding protein-3. That's why the reason to check both uh, in the um, workup of short stature. So, congenital hypopituitarism. This is the classic newborn who they uh, will, may have hypoglycemia. If it's a male, they may have microphallus. They may also have prolonged neonatal jaundice, and in fact, there has been an association of growth hormone deficiency with paucity of bile ducts. So look for that as growth hormone itself or as part of a TSH deficiency in this, in this picture. Midline defects, and then when they do the MRI, it's a smaller absent pituitary. Um, the hormones would show low growth hormone. This is one time in life you can actually check a growth hormone level. Most other times, checking growth hormone level is useless because growth hormone is secreted in a pulsatile way, so you could catch it at the top of the pulse or the bottom of the pulse. So don't order random growth hormone levels unless the patient is a newborn. Low TSH, free T4, low free T4, cortisol, low FSH, and LH. I had a kid just two weeks ago, I couldn't put this in the board review yet because the slides were already made, in the, in the newborn nursery, who had uh, complete cleft lip and cleft palate. They were hypoglycemic. The child was, um, also had an adrenal crisis in, in the NICU with hypotension, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and then when transferred to, the, um, the, to, the, to our main campus, we you know, re replenished the fluids, gave hydrocortisone, gave growth hormone, and um, the diagnosis was, hy was hypopituitarism. So the treatment, like I said, replacement of growth hormone will resolve that hypoglycemia in the newborn. Uh, for ACTH deficiency, the Remember that checking cortisol and ACTH doesn't work at this age because your ACTH will be normal or low. So we replace with hydrocortisone. But in the TSH deficiency, this is very important to note that a newborn screen 
um, in, in most states is only a TSH with a backup of T4. So you, if your TSH is normal or low, as in central hypothyroidism, you may miss it. So you always have to look for the free T4 also in those babies where you're, where you're suspicious of that. And the other pearl to remember is that if you're supposing you start your thyroid replacement before you start hydrocortisone, then the thyroid uh, hormone will increase the clearance of cortisol and you may precipitate adrenal insufficiency in a baby. So you have to start growth hormone, hydrocortisone, and then thyroid in that order, okay? Acquired hypopituitarism. Now this is the, the, this can be various causes. Non-accidental trauma, don't forget, because you might see those kids in your practice. Tumors, um, inflammation, CMV, toxo, uh, infiltration, radiation, like brain tumor survivors, surgical or vascular, or some uh, medications also. So pituitary tumors, as you can see, this kid has a cleft cyst, so this is not really a tumor, but rather a space-occupying lesion in the pituitary that can cause hypopituitarism. So you can see that the Rathke cleft cyst here in this, in this child caused, uh, caused uh, pituitary hypofunction. So if you have hypopituitarism, doing an MRI is a useful thing, not just because you're gonna have a tumor there, but it could be an inclusion cyst or any other. And craniopharyngiomas, as you know, are benign tumors. So tumors in the pituitary, um, the case I remember was about five year, five or seven years ago, there was this teenager who was 18 years old and he came in with a severe, he had seizures when he came in. So they did, you know, the seizure workup and all that. And then there was this very astute medical student who did a complete review of systems. And in the review of systems, he found that this kid was drinking a lot and peeing a lot and just drinking, drinking, drinking all day long. That history never came in the other, um, when everybody else had taken the history. This kid also had, so he was maintaining his sodium, turned out he had hypopituitarism and had a germinoma. And we, did, we missed it because, I mean, in, initially, because his growth was fine, he was 18 years old, so his growth was complete. His puberty had been completed, so he didn't have pubertal delay, so the only thing he had was DI and um, you know, seizures from the, from the tumor. So the onset may be insidious. They may present with one or more hormone deficiencies. DI may be the presenting feature because of stretching of the stalk. Post-op, you must watch for DI and SIADH. So they can go right from hyponatremia from SIADH to DI, hypernatremia, and back into hyponatremia. So just watch for these kids very carefully. Post-radiation, it's important to remember that hypopituitarism may take many years to develop, and so every year you have to check these kids for pituitary hormone deficiencies. And the kids who've had radiation due to, um, um, you know, tumor, due to uh, cancer, growth hormone is most commonly affected even after a small dose of radiation. They may also present with precocious puberty. So sometimes you see this kid who's suddenly growing well and you're saying, hey, they're fine, but that's actually the precocious puberty causing them to grow, but eventually they stop growing. And I think I have a, I have a graph of that too. Now this is something that uh, they do ask in your boards, and that is the Condelay versus familial short stature, where you have short parents, so there's a family history. In Condelay, you have a late bloomer parent who grew late, uh, both are short. Growth velocities actually could be normal in both. In Condele, you can have a slight dip before they go back into puberty, so that can fool you sometimes. The bone age is the distinguishing feature here, where in Condele of puberty, the bone age is less than the chronological age, whereas familial short stature, they are equal to the chronologic age. Of course, nowadays with obese kids, this doesn't hold true. If your kid is obese, then the bone age may be advanced from obesity. So um, sometimes this doesn't hold, the chronological age delay, this bone age delay does not hold true in an obese patient. But most kids, you will see this bone age delay. So SGA. So we talked about SGA, like asking about the birth weight. It's very important because SGA infants may sh fail to show catch-up growth by two years of age. And, about, and that's seen in about seven to 10%. 
And it can also be seen in, uh, you know, uh, some syndromes like Russell Silver syndrome. You will have a history of SGA. Some genetic syndromes may have a history of SGA. But if you have no syndrome and they're just SGA, remember to keep following them and giving them about two years to catch up growth. And after that, we can give growth hormone. The main thing to remember, though, they are not growth hormone deficient, so you have to use a larger than normal dose of growth hormone for these kids, and they're also at risk for insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Turner syndrome. So um, the case I remember for Turner syndrome, um, of course this is a common one, is this girl who came to me because she had abnormal thyroid function. It was not for short stature, it was just for abnormal thyroid function. She was about 14 years old, and I was just reviewing, reviewing her chart before going into the room, and I found that they had done um, FSH and LH, and they were not flagged as abnormal because they were in the menopausal range. So they were like super high, but not flagged because the computer didn't flag it because it was still in the range. So the, even the pediatrician's um, referral only looked at the TSH, but not at the FSH and LH and this kid had no puberty. And when I looked at her, I had to do a completely undressed exam. She was an athlete, she was a volleyball player, very great self-esteem. She was not bothered, she was short. So she'd never gone to the pediatrician saying, I'm short. So um, I did call the pediatrician back. She had uh, um, mosaic Turner syndrome, and I called the pediatrician back and I said, did you, you know, this was mosaic? And she said, yeah, I thought about it, but I never thought to send a karyotype. So just send it, it's okay. You know, and also do the complete exam, you know. Sometimes with the athletes, they look muscular. You might put it off as, oh, they're just muscular, but it could just be that Turner syndrome phenotype that you might be missing. So um, renal malformation, they can have a horseshoe kidney, and growth retardation is related to defects in the Shocks gene. So Russell Silver syndrome. So, like I said, I'm just going to talk about a couple of the syndromes, not too many because your genetics folks are the best for that. So, Russell Silver syndrome is that little triangular face, SGA kid, had, ha, usually has hypoglycemia in, 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 in infancy, feeding difficulties in infancy. They may have frontal bossing, some clinodactyly, some asymmetry. That's very difficult, though, to, to appreciate. Um, and 10% have this un maternal uniparental disomy of chromosome 7, and growth hormone supposed, uh, does help them. Noonan syndrome, we talk about Turner, so we got to talk about Noonan's also, because you can see Noonan syndrome where you, it, I, I, I really don't like to use the term female, you know, it, it's like a Turner but in a male or whatever, because people think about it like that with the web neck, hubertus valgus. You can almost think like that, but it's totally an unrelated syndrome. Um, in fact, the heart problems are pulmonary side, whereas remember in Turner syndrome, they are on the aortic side. And uh, the Turner syndrome, um, Noonan's is because of mutation in the PTPN11 gene. So it's a completely different syndrome, but the only common thing, I guess, is short stature, web neck, and the cubitus. Okay, but growth hormone is approved for Turner's also. So this is um, a growth chart. Now, instead of giving you more and more lists of things, I decided to show you some graphs. So you can see this kid um, has, you know, increased. This is a weight chart and the, and the height chart. And you can see the weight continues to increase, even though it's on the lower end. But the height gradually uh, fails. And that could be a child on um, chronic glucocorticoids with the Cushingoid appearance, but they may not even look Cushingoid. And the first sign you may see is just the growth dipping. So if you have an increase in the height, in the weight, not necessarily obesity, just growth failure could be enough um, to show you that this is because of corticosteroids. Growth hormone deficiency, um, this kid, again, this is, um, this is the period when this kid was treated with growth hormone and the reason to put this chart here is to show you that with growth hormone therapy, you can, res you can achieve a good height. So like I said, the most severe type is this IgA, uh, in, uh, idiopathic growth hormone deficiency type 1A. They're born, they may be born short or normal. Uh, they can see micropenis in the boys. Infants have hypoglycemia, mid-face hypoplasia, and the stim test is what we do with the IgF1 and IgF-BP3 being low. 
But this can be very, very um, insidious where you may not see all these classic symptoms, but yet you see the little dip in the, in the linear growth. And Down syndrome I put up here because it is a very common cause of short stature, but we do not give growth hormone because of the risk of malignancy. And remember that they also have a higher risk of autoimmune problems. The George I put up here because um, I have only three more syndromes, promise you. So the George I put here because of the history of, of you will see hypocalcemia with it and because of the hypoparathyroidism. These kids can present with seizures in the newborn period. Fanconi is somewhat interesting because you can see these kids, um, the, these kids can be also missed because they can present with this very subtle anemia, but then they have radial aplasia and short stature. And I have at least uh, two families that I follow with Fanconi. Of course, those kids are pretty um, obvious, but one kid was diagnosed because of the absent radius. And they can have growth hormone deficiency and hypothyroidism. Prada-Willi, I bring that up here also because of another child I used to see. Um, they had, that kid had um, hypoglycemia in the newborn period and also had uh, uh, umbilical hernia. So remember the Prada Willy can also give you short stature and the growth hormone is used very cautiously due to respiratory imp impairment in these kids. And NF1 also, um, you can say cafe au spots and uh, look in the, uh, for axillary freckling in these kids. That could be the first um, sign that you see. And short stature is very common in these kids. So just a list of uses of growth hormone for you before we move on to puberty. Um, FDA approved is growth hormone deficiency turners, SGA, renal insufficiency, ISS, which is, I don't really, you know, there's this whole basket of conditions that people say is ISS. It's idiopathic. It, it, it's FDA uh, defines it as less than minus 2.25 SDS below the growth, uh, below the uh, uh, growth percentile. But a lot of kids just get into that diagnosis without meeting those FDA standards. HIV wasting, adult growth hormone deficiency, and not FDA approved are all of these conditions, which you might see us using growth hormone for. So now we move to puberty. Hopefully you are all still awake. So, in males, I think this is something they do ask, what is the first sign of puberty in males? The first sign of puberty in males is increased testicular size, more than 5, 4 ml, but how many pediatricians have orchidometers in their offices? I would say zero. I didn't have one in my office when I was a pediatrician. So you have your little um, measuring tape. So more than 2.5 centimeters in the uh, longitudinal diameter of the, of the oval testes is more than that is in puberty. Normal age of puberty for boys, 9 to 12, and that is the start of puberty. And the tanner stage of pubic hair is not indicative of testicular growth. Think about CAH, where you can have tanner 3, tanner 4, but the testes are still prepubertal. Females, the breast thelarchy is the first sign, and anything less than 8 is considered early puberty. And the average age of menarche has not changed. And I'm not going into the details of the Erm and Gidden study and all those, that data that show that the age of menarche has not changed in spite of the eight, earlier age of thelarchy in girls in the United States. So, of course, you know about tanner staging. Um, the... Tanner one is basically no hair. Tanner two, I say hair that you can count. Tanner three, if it's more than you can count, it's usually tanner three. Don't go into the whole curly, you know, black here, there. Just say if it's more than you can count, a little bit curly, then it's tanner three. And breasts, again, the best way to, th this shows an upright exam, but I like to examine the breasts when they're lying down because then you can look at the mound and the secondary mound. Of the, of, the, uh, of the nipple and the areola over the breast tissue. So I really don't like to do tanner staging sitting up. And that was one of the problems in the Ehrman Giddens study where they did, where they surveyed pediatricians and tried to have them do the tanner staging. Some of them did it just sitting up and it, it's never particularly accurate when you do it sitting up, especially with the obesity 
in girls, you may not see it, you may not be able to measure it very well. So premature adrenarche. So premature adrenarche is really early appearance of pubertal androgen, and it's because you, you can see acne, axillary odor, sexual hair, and it's only f because there's uh, the androgens from the zona reticularitis of, of the adrenal cortex. This is not from true testicular androgens or ovarian um, you know, androgens. It, it's basically adrenal androgens that are causing premature adrenarche. So in females with premature adrenarche, you'll see no breast development. But I see this a lot as, oh my God, my five-year-old has hair. Tell me what to do. Um, in males, there is no testicular enlargement. So what do you do? What test do you do? You don't have to do FSH and LH in girls because this is not puberty. If, your test, if you don't have breasts, you just have hair, you can just check for the androgens, the DHEs, and you can look at testosterone. So in true premature adrenarche, which is benign, you will not have an increase in testosterone. And there is no bone age advancement. Again, the caveat is that if you are obese, you can have bone age advancement just from obesity. So basically, the management is careful monitoring, and they usually progress through normal puberty. And there is some evidence that the benign premature adrenarche in girls may predispose them to PCOS. So that's another opportunity to tell them, hey, your child's you know, obese. Make sure that you, um, you, know, you have a higher risk for PCOS, and that could have caused um, a little opportunity for um, counseling at that point. So, in, so the main reason to worry about premature adrenarche is CAH. So as you know, CAH, the, all those different horm, um, adrenal hormone synthesis, the steroid synthesis, you have the 21 hydroxylase. So the hormone that's proximal to the 21 hydroxylase is the 17 OHP. So you'll have increased testosterone levels because it spills over to the testosterone side and you have increased 17 OHP level, advanced bone age because of that. In males, they'll have small testes and look virilized, and females may have clitromegaly. And this is not your classic uh, salt-wasting baby in the NICU. This is your ba a child who comes into your office with a little hair, your increased testosterone. This could be one of the differential diagnoses. Premature thelarchy, on the other hand, is appearance of breast development before the age of eight. Uh, it's usually benign. You can have a small increase in FSH, but usually not increase in LH. So if your LH is in, in the um, uh, sensitive assays that I used nowadays, then even a detectable LH is not uh, normal. So there's no advance in bone age. It usually regresses. And the differential diagnosis is exogenous estrogen. So ask about history of using creams at home or lavender oil or tea tree oil. I think I'm totally out of time. So I'm going to end up with work up of, almost done? Okay, okay. So work up of precocious puberty, you do FSH, LH levels, estradiol, thyroid function test, don't forget that, a bone age x-ray, a pelvic ultrasound, may or may not, you don't always have to do it. And if your FSH and LH are in the pubertal range, you may do a brain MRI, and they, then they need to come to see us for a GnRH stem test. And the differential diagnosis of precocious puberty would be benign premature thelarchy, like we talked about, exogenous estrogens. If they have vaginal bleeding, do consider a vaginal foreign body. Like, girls put toys in there. Ask about this dirty discharge that you could have. I had this girl who was five years old, this brownish discharge for past month. It's not menarche. It's a, it could be a foreign body. You may not see anything. you will have to send them to your friendly GYN to do an examination under anesthesia. Estrogen-producing tumor can cause it, and McCune-Albright syndrome, where you can have cafe au lait spots, fibrous dysplasia, and um, premature uh, puberty. So like we said, differential diagnosis would be idiopathic central precocious puberty, a CNS disorder like hypothalamic hematoma, and F1 can cause precocious puberty. Also, you can have the auto autonomous androgen production like we talked about, the CAH, um, a tumor in the testes, a testotoxicosis. This was a kid I saw who was six years old, was the most muscular in his um, baseball team, and the guy had an LH receptor mutation because he had very high testosterone. And pubertal gynecomastia is something that we do see a lot because um, it, it's actually normal, but again, if it, if it persists beyond six months, 
or you know, resol usually resolves in two years, but with obese patients, it's a problem, and it doesn't usually resolve. And so um, this is the most problematic kid who comes to you because he won't take his shirt off in the swimming pool because he's so shy of that. So the problem is there's no great treatment for it. So if, if weight loss doesn't help it, if observa which, with observation it doesn't go down, they, they may actually need plastic surgery to fix it so they can actually have a normal social life. Don't forget about marijuana as a cause of gynecomastia. Okay, so I did have a kid who came into my office who was doing recreational marijuana, not recreational, medicinal marijuana for some pain um, you know, syndrome, and he had significant gynecomastia from that. This is a rare cause. It's one of those that you see uh, in reports about estrogens from meat. But remember, anabolic steroid use can cause small testes, big muscles, and gynecomastia. And prolactin is not elevated. I see a lot of prolactins being ordered for gynecomastia. Remember, prolactin causes milk production and galactoria, but not gynecomastia. Okay, so re reassure and watch. And if it's more than two years, you consider therapy. And as they say, uh, pediatric endocrinology is um, basically um, diligent neglect and uh, watchful expectancy. So we just watch a lot of things. We watch growth, we watch puberty, but you have to keep watching it carefully, and then you'll be an endocrinologist. Thank you.